Top Bed Talk. Monty Mython here. As we prepare to move into the next phase of the COVID crisis, we're going to be widening our focus here on Top Bed Talk. We will continue to deliver COVID-specific programmes, but we all have a huge additional responsibility as we try to reboot normal services. So although this piece is not directly related to COVID-19, we believe it's information that is crucial to the bigger task of rebuilding the healthcare system as we learn to adapt and live with this new virus. Thank you to our sponsors and to you, our listeners, for helping us to share this important information. It's very exciting, but now we're going to hear some practical experiences from Mike Spiro and Jez Fabe, who are going to tell us what uh, it's like using it at the bedside. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Spiro. I'm an anaesthetic consultant at the Royal Free, and this is Jez Fabes, who's one of our academic clinical fellows. We're going to talk today about HPI in clinical practice. We heard pretty clearly from Monty that there's plenty of evidence out there that single episodes of hypotension are associated with adverse events. And we're lucky at the Royal Free in that the flow track is our current departmental standard for major hepatobiliary surgery. And so when we were asked to trial this upgraded software, it seemed like quite an exciting opportunity, even though I have to say I was extremely sceptical. I was told that this device would give us 15 to, or 10 or 5 to 15 minutes of warning before a hypotensive event. And I thought, you know, given that in the major HBB patients we've got a complex patient having complex surgery and a variable anaesthetist in myself... How can a machine predict something that we can't see when looking at an arterial line? Anyway, I played with it a little bit in theatre, and I have to say it made me quite uncomfortable the first time I used it. I had a beautiful screen, beautiful chart, yet I was still being told the patient's chance of of hypotension was 90%. And it made me very anxious, and I couldn't play with my iPhone quite as much as normal. And yet... When it told me that the hypertension was coming, even though my art line looked lovely and I couldn't see much swing and everything else, it, it did actually happen, and that made me feel even more uncomfortable in my clinical ability. So anyway, we thought we'd select a patient cohort which had very differing fluid demands and differing anaesthetic management, and I'll come on to that again in a minute. Our primary objective was to determine the predictive value of HPI in these complex surgical patients, And secondarily, to look at whether HPI value correlated with the risk and severity of hypotension in these patients, and also how HPI compared to traditional markers of hemodynamic instability, like stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation. We also were interested in looking at whether alternative MAP targets, whether the device worked for those as well, because we all know that MAP of 65 may not be appropriate to all patients. So we included adult patients between January and March of 2018 in two of our operating theatres, which basically do some of the major elective HPB surgery. And we included patients who had the flow track cardiac output device with a CVP monitoring as well. We excluded patient death, short surgical procedures, and actually we didn't have to exclude anyone. We identified those in advance. And the anaesthetist was unaware of the HPI software upgrade that had happened. So they knew they had the flow track, but they didn't know that they could see the HPI value, and that was hidden from them. So they were unaware of it. And we retrospectively collected the data in an anonymised fashion. So I chose this patient cohort because in those operating theatres, we are doing predominantly liver resections, which we try to run extremely dry to prevent parenchymal back bleeding during parenchymal resection and Whipple's and pancreatic surgical patients because they have a very different hemodynamic problem, which is that on handling of the pancreas, they become very systemically inflamed with a systemic inflammatory response-like syndrome and need an awful lot of fluid. So they were very kind of interesting for a device that's trying to predict the future. I'm going to hand over to Jez now. He's going to talk you through our results and our data analysis. So in this three-month period, catchment time, we got 40 patients that met our inclusion and exclusion criteria. As Mike's already alluded to, predominantly complex intra-abdominal surgery, the majority of that hepatobiliary in nature. 
median time duration for these cases was just over four hours. And within that surgical time, within each surgical hour, there was a median of six minutes of hypotension defined as a map lower than 65. And that sort of 10% prevalence incidence of hypotension is more or less in keeping with a large case series and similar patient cohorts. Just a little bit on how we analysed our data. We've taken a slightly different approach to how the Edwards team have approached this. So uh, on the top there, you can see sort of moving from left to right, an x-axis as it were, your periods of normotension in blue and hypotension in red, and the Edwards method, the topmost of those two bars. So in their analysis that you've seen the data from, they identify stable periods of hypotension and stable periods of normotension, retrospectively go back in time to identify HPI readings prior to that, and then perform their tests for predictive value, sensitivity, etc. We've taken a slightly different perspective on this to try and see how well this works for your clinician in theatre. So the lower bar shows, again, exactly the same surgical process, and all of the horizontal black lines demonstrate where we've taken HPI readings every 20 seconds. And then we've looked for the correlation between those and the presence of hypotension at various time points subsequent to that throughout the entire anaesthetic case. That's for a couple of reasons. One, it's because we feel predominantly in theatre you're using all of these metrics of hemodynamic instability as trends, and you can be interested to see how your HPI evolves in keeping with all of your other metrics. So other slight difference between ourselves and the Edwards team is they've grouped all of their population in one big analysis. We've taken a slight different approach. We've calculated sensitivity, positive predictive value, etc. for each individual case, and then take an average of the entire case series for two reasons. One, to try and minimise the impact of long surgical cases, which would generate more of the data, and two, to try and give a reflection of the typical case you'd experience use of this bit of technology. Slight differences between ourselves and Edwards, again, in how you clean the data. So, obviously, this was collected in a blinded fashion, so we were unable to stop, obviously, the anaesthetists from applying interventions to prevent hypotension. We've got a fairly robust way of picking these out of the data. And then there's a couple of different ways you can look at cleaning these out. Present data from both methods. On the left, in the tables as we progress, you'll see just nullifying these entire episodes of intervention. And on the right, you'll see data where you define these as would have been hypotension. So if we look at how this works then, so this is looking at a map threshold of 65 millimetres of mercury at various time thresholds. And if we look in the leftmost of the two five-minute columns, you can see a fairly reasonable sensitivity and specificity and an associated very good negative predictive value but a slightly less good positive predictive value. You can see at more acute time points that all of those markers of determination improve. And then on the right in the blue coloured box, that's the approach of taking all of those intervention data points and treating them as if they were hypotensive. So you see quite a significant improvement in the positive predictive value, but a reduction in your negative predictive value. From this point on, I'm just going to present you data, our preferred way of analysing it, where you nullify all of the intervention time points. On the right of these two images, you can see the prevalence of hypotension five minutes subsequent to any given HPI reading. So on the histogram on the right, you see quite a nicely negatively skewed distribution of the prevalence of hypotension. And as we go up through larger magnitude HPI readings, you can see your incidence of hypertension increases significantly. That's just reflected again on the left, where you can see if we set the odds ratio of hypotension at 1 for comparison in the lower HPI ranges, as you go up through increasing magnitudes of HPI readings, you get larger and larger odds of hypotension. Interestingly, though, we found no association at all between the magnitude of the HPI reading and the severity of any subsequent hypotension. So the standard receiver operator curves here. So in the blue, top leftmost, is our HPI reading, showing very good discriminant value. That's got a C statistic or AUC of 0.85. Interestingly, we found that the SVRI was also quite a good metric in this setting, with an AUC of about 0.75. But you can see that our traditional markers of volume responsiveness, SVV and PPV, were no better than chance in this setting. I've already alluded to this in the previous tables, but if we again generate another received profit to curve for HPI at different time thresholds, we can see the lower right curve in blue again at five minutes. And as we go to shorter and shorter time points, the discriminant value of HPI improves with at one minute an AUC of about 0.95. The other thing we're interested in is looking at different thresholds for hypotension that Mike referred to earlier. 
So you can see at the top uh, the data I've already presented with a mat threshold of 65, and on the right, identical analysis, but redefining our threshold of hypertension at 70 millimetres of mercury. And you can see, unsurprisingly, a slight reduction in the negative predictive value, but a significant improvement in the positive predictive value. Conversely, if we go at lower mean arterial pressures, you get the converse trend. So what can we conclude from this? I think we've shown that HPI outperforms the current indices for predicting hemodynamic instability, so stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation, with a good negative predictive value. The positive predictive value depends very much on how you analyse the data and the methodology behind that. And I don't think there's a right or a wrong way, there's just different ways to do it. There's a very good association with hypotensive risk, but no association with the severity of that subsequent hypotension. And as you get closer to the hypotensive event, the HPI reading is more effective at predicting that. We think it's acceptable to use that algorithm at a map target of 70, but probably less useful at 60 as the positive predictive value was, was, was just so low. Can I invite any questions? Nick Majerison here. Have you got yourself onto edpom.org yet? If not, you might not be aware, Edpom Chicago. Tickets are free for a limited period only. Go now to edpom.org. Evidence-based perioperative medicine. edpom.org.